It was the Friday before Christmas. I was dressed as a slutty elf, <laughs> handing out free Jägermeister shots from my homemade cigarette girl tray in the middle of a crowded makeshift dance floor at the most tragic gay strip club in San Francisco's seediest neighborhood. <laughs> you know, Christmas. <laughs> my whole universe was there. All the party children. Everybody wanted a shot or to say hi and have a little fondle on my jingle balls. <laughs> then, sweet baby Jesus in a manger. In a heartbeat, all my sexy fun stopped. Across the dance floor, I saw a tall woman in a ratty trench coat, leaning forward like into a stiff wind, with narrowed eyes and hair raked back in an angry bun. Julie. She was coming straight for me, cutting a swath through all the dancers and prancers and vixens, a furious hot knife through all that queer butter. <laughs> Julie was smart and mean and litigious and homeless. This woman was about to ruin my whole career in the real world, and before that, she would kill, she would ruin this whole part. Kill all the boners of all the girls and all the boys. How, could, how did she even get inside here? This holy terror who had never smiled in her life had somehow made her way into the silliest quasi-legal queer holiday bacchanal ever. She was so out of place. I would have been less shocked, less surprised, to see Jesus himself, the reason for the season. <laughs> it was the early 2000s. I was a licensed clinical social worker at an outpatient program at San Francisco General Hospital. We, our office was a trailer, a bunch of trailers connected in the parking lot right outside of the hospital emergency room. I worked with people who had all the problems, all the big problems schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, HIV, hep C, uh, heroin addiction, all, all the things, chronic homelessness. They were in and out of jail, they were in and out of that exact emergency room. That's why we worked with them. And I loved the work. By the time these people got to me, they had every reason to give up on life, but they didn't. And together we fought. We fought for health, we fought for dignity, we fought for some version of joy in their lives. Every client was different, every day was different, it was creative, it was technical. I had to be ready for my, any one of my clients to do pretty much anything at any moment. There was an art to it. It was a great job. One rainy day, my boss came into my office in the trailer with this huge paper medical file folder with the metal, people work in medicine, with those metal bread things that hold all the papers in. Two hole punch was like our, our thing. Um, she said, this woman will be a challenge. Let me know if you need anything. That's when I got really worried, because my boss never said that about any client. This was, we took people that all the other programs had fired. All these clients. Uh, people who started fires, people who were violent, people who had just not been able to hold or get the, you know, been able to attach to any sort of services. Uh, the trailer was where, that was where the crazy train stopped, literally. Like we were the last resort for a lot of people in San Francisco. The file it was so big because it was full of complaint letters and investigations and all this, this letterhead. It was all this letterhead because Julie had uh, filed formal charges against all sorts of social workers, all sorts of agencies, against the county itself, against the state. And so it was, and, and, and then there were all these responses and all these letters and investigations, and that's what my boss handed me was all this stuff. It was the San Francisco Department of Public Health, the San Francisco General Hospital Medical Ethics Committee, the State Medical Office, um, the Ombudsman's Office, which I didn't even know what an Ombudsman was, but there's Ombudsman's everywhere, and she had found them all. <laughs> and, my, and I knew, like, I looked at this, I was like, okay, this is why my boss said this. My name is going to be all over the next batch of letterhead. This is all, this is coming, coming to me. Uh, Miss Julie dropped in the next day to meet me, her new social worker. She was dignified and imperious. She stood very straight with a long, jutting neck. She looked like a really pissed off egret. <laughs> she looked younger than her age in the mid in, her, in the mid fifties, and she had a challenging figure. She was fabulous and terrifying. She was my very own Disney villain. 
I shook her cool dry, cool, dry hand and took her through the narrow hallway of the trailers to one of the really tiny, cramped uh, uh, appointment therapy rooms that we had. She talked a mile a minute about all the people I was going to help her punish, all the people, like all the grudges she had and all these people that had not lost their jobs yet, that she was going to use me to get them all fired. Um, she plucked her tongue and said, what a sad office this is. She's like, are, are you really sure this is up to code? Because you really are part of the hospital, right? Uh, she evaluated me as we sat down in this tiny little room. Before, right before she started barking orders, she looked at my hair, she looked all the way down to my shoes, she looked into my soul, and she was not having any of it. She was not pleased with anything she saw in my person or in my soul. The, for her first command was that I file a, a case against her, her last social worker, some guy across town I had never met in the homeless program. And so I said, well, I think it's more important to focus on what you want for yourself for now like food, like housing, really basic stuff that we know you need because you're in our program, versus stuff that happened in the past. Um, and she looked daggers at me and she said, you're just like all the other ones. You don't know your job. She made threats against my career and told me all the places, the ombudsman of the world that she was gonna you know, file letters with and get me fired. And she stood up, she gathered all her height and all her drama and she stood up to walk out and then she turned back to me and said, so when is our next appointment? And can you give me an appointment card? <laughs> so and I, was, I was actually kind of in a sadist, uh, kind of masochist way, really thrilled at that moment. Um, and then two weeks later, it was Christmas, and we're throwing this big, my friends and I are throwing this big crazy party in the all new gay porn theater, porn palace place. <laughs> I did these parties about once a month back then. Not in this place, usually they were random bars, straight bars that didn't know we were coming. It was really fun. Um, yeah, totally, it was great, it was great. Once the bartenders started get, getting all the tips, they chilled out, but it was like a hundred queers in costume would come descend on these people. Um, and they, this party, but the, we, we planned this party ahead. You had to like rent out, just so you know, you gotta rent out a gay porn theater, so they'll let you bring your own alcohol in and all this stuff. Um, and it got a ladder. We had a celebrity DJ. Dropping names is gross, and this is the only name I'll drop, but I just want you to know like, what a big deal this was in my, in my life and in San Francisco queerdom. Our DJ was John Cameron Mitchell, Miss Hedwig. So that was, yeah, <gasps> thank you. Thank you for the gasps of recognition. I appreciate it, I appreciate it. So Miss Hedwig, Miss Hedwig was our DJ. It was very fabulous. Um, we had strippers, of course. It's a porn theater. We had drag queens, of course, and they were free to pull their dicks out because it was a strip club. Um, and we had a gospel singer from New York somehow, and her, her piano player, her keyboard player, and she sent us running all over the tenderloin looking for fried chicken for her, which we did. She was amazing. She did a really good job on the stage with the strippers. And then we decorated. Honey, did we decorate? We had so much fun. In the basement of this really old porn theater were the, all the little booths, with the, the, the porn video booths with the glory holes. And so and we replaced all the VHS, like old school, VHS porn videos with the, with the Rankin Bass animated Christmas specials. <laughs> so there's, there's Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph and all, you know, all, this, all the stuff you raise your children on, like all that stuff was playing in the video booths. And then everybody please guess with me, what did, what did, we, what did we put over the glory halls? Mistletoe. Thank you, Mistletoe. <laughs> Dirty, dirty, I love it. Okay, so, and it was, it was adorable, like, this was, you know, this was over the glory holes, and then we washed our hands about 20 times. <laughs> These parties mean a lot to me. I grew up in Marion, South Carolina, population 8,000, and um, pretty much everything I was doing for this party, you know, being this expressive, creative, crazy, queer party person, would have gotten me the beat down of my life. I mean, just saying ejaculate conception, would have probably gotten me, would have gotten me, yeah, exactly. It was on our poster, that was on our poster for the party, it would have gotten me killed. Um, and I was doing this, and so it was this really amazing thing for me, a small town, you know, queer kid from South Carolina. Um, it, was, it was everything I never knew that I always wanted, if that makes sense. So decorate, 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 night came. Put on my little, put on my little elf hat. And I put on my cigarette, I like mounted on my chest my cigarette roll tray made out of a thrift store briefcase. It had Christmas lights and red bows and shit on it. And in the, in, in the thing it was, uh, had scotch and Jägermeister. Because it's, it's a strip club and in San Francisco or in California, if the strippers go full nude, you can't actually serve alcohol there, which is another, that is a big problem I'll tell you about later if you want to ask me about like why the economics of that don't work out on behalf of the employees, the sex workers, but, or the strippers, but anyway. 
we had to bring our own alcohol. So um, it was showtime. We opened the doors, there was a line around the block, we had searchlights on the street, we had a, a red carpet, um, and it was exciting. The party started. I started my bar service on the dance floor. Um, our celebrity DJ was playing great music. I was getting kisses for shots, which was not anything I requested, but I'll take it. And then I saw Julie. She was headed right toward me. She was leaning you know, into the wind, the angry bond. She was heading right toward me because she had seen the alcohol. She hadn't seen my face yet. And I couldn't, I was like so stunned. I couldn't, I was like, what the, how is this woman from that other world? Like, why is she even here? She's never, you know, she doesn't smile. She doesn't have fun. Why is she here? So I grabbed my bottles. I grabbed my little tray and my bottles and I tried to turn around. And just for future, just so you all know for your future parties like this, it's really, really hard to turn around and get across a crowded dance floor of happy alcoholics when you're giving out when you're giving out free drinks. Like they don't want you, they don't want you to turn around and get the hell out of there. So it was, it was, I, was I was trapped. I was trapped. You know, my, it was like lights. It was lit up like a Christmas billboard. So it was really hard to get myself off, you know, away from her. My friend was like, "Where are you going?" And I couldn't answer. I couldn't say, "Shut up! I'm running from somebody." Like I couldn't say anything. I certainly couldn't say. I'm avoiding a client for work because of the ethical boundary issues of serving your client alcohol and because of therapeutic transference and therapeutic countertransference and because I don't want to have to explain this outfit and this whole fucking party to the county health commission and lose this job that I really love. So those are the things I did not say. And then she was close enough that I thought that I turned around, I was trying to get away from her and I finally heard her voice. She said, excuse me, excuse me, I need a drink. And I just kept like pushing, pushing, and like people were like, what are you doing? Give me a drink, why are you pushing me? And I was like, you know, it was awful. And so, <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was an ugly moment. And I was trying to run over them and like smash them with my bottles, it was bad news. And then I heard her again, she was closer, I need a drink. And I was struggling, struggling. And then there was a hand on my shoulder. Excuse me, I need a drink. And I was, I was stuck, I was at her mercy. I didn't, that was, I was just, I was, it was over. Everything was over. The party was over, the job was over, it was all, I was just totally screwed. So I turned around, and she, she saw me. I saw her. I was paralyzed. And I just was imagining what she was doing. I imagined her like pulling out a notebook and like writing down every single thing that I was doing or that this party was doing that was wrong and how this was getting fired, ethics, and you know, the list of the ombudsman's persons. And but she didn't do she didn't do any of that. She looked at me and she said, "Hello, Hunter. Could I have a drink of what you have there?" And the smart thing to do would have been to say no, right? <laughs> Social workers or clinical people do not give their clients alcohol. I wanted her. I wanted her out of my party. I needed her out of there. It's you know, general practice. We don't do that. Um, but I, I just decided, fuck it. She's a, she's a person at the party, too. And I poured half a shot. I figured that was like 50% of a fireable ethical violation. And it had just a little bit of Jägermeister. And I handed it to her with a little elfin bow. And I said, Merry Christmas, Julie. And she took the drink, smiled back at me. Again, this woman had never smiled in her life. And just started chatting with the person next to her. And then somebody grabbed my ass. <laughs> And she looked back at me, and she looked at me for a moment, and we just kind of checked each other, and she's this amazing, smart, suffering woman, just taking a break. Like, I think she just wandered in off the sidewalk, taking a break from her incredibly hard life. I have no idea what trauma she lived through. I said, oh, I will never know. She never told me. Um, but she was taking a little break from fighting everyone and everything about whatever there was to fight about. And me, her social worker, who was supposed to be professional, um, who was being as ridiculous as possible with this crazy crowd of happy freaks. And I was jumping out of my skin to get away from her. She was calmer than I'd ever seen her. And that was it. Gaze broke, I turned around, I like, ran and kind of sweated and had a couple shots of my own up upstairs in the green room. And then back in the hospital on Monday morning, I was back in my social worker calculated casual attire. She was on time for the appointment. She hustled me along the narrow hallway to our little appointment room through the trailer, the silly little trailer we worked in. She said with a sweeping gesture, you know, these people do try it, but this place is just a disgrace. This office is a terrible disgrace. And she was, she was right. 
Neither one of us mentioned the party that day. Neither one of us mentioned the party ever. And we worked together for three more months before she fired me. <laughs> Thanks.